Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. Once again, if you'd like to follow along, John, chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. At the time the the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law? I said, You are God's. If he calls them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Therefore you were seeking... Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond Jerusalem to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. The Gospel of John has 21 chapters in it, and we are now officially about halfway through this particular book of the New Testament because we are at the closing part of chapter 10. But I want to say to you, remember that chapter 10, although made up of 42 verses, 21 we addressed last week, 21 we're addressing today, is really a part of a bigger story. It's not only connected this week and last week, this chapter 10 that we're dealing with, but it's also connected to problems that have existed before, problems with the people, problems with some of the religious leaders, problems with people who were dissatisfied with Jesus, not convinced that he was the Christ, not wanting to be convinced that he's the Christ. Whatever problem that they had in their attempts to dethrone him, this is a continuation of that saga. And what I want us to do this morning is, I want us to begin with the first couple of verses of Scripture, John chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. And it is in this passage of Scripture that we read about the Feast of Dedication. Now, let me just say that that was a reference to a time during what we call the intertestamental period of time. That's the 400-year period of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God was silent, and it was during that time that the temple in Jerusalem had some terrible things befall it. And it was left in disarray, and it was cleaned up and cleansed uh, as the law of Moses would require at one point in time. And so this eight-day feast, which is sometimes called the Feast of Renovation, was brought about. And we read at that time the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. This is simply a word in the New Testament that means it was that time of year when it was cold. And based upon the jacket some of you are wearing, you think that it's winter right now. But I remind you, we live in Florida. So, we read that Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico or the porch of Solomon. Some of your translations will say porch. And let me see if we can maybe get a better picture in our head as to what this means by giving you a couple of pictures. If you take a look at this particular image of the temple 
in Jerusalem, you'll see the temple on the inside and you'll see the wall surrounding it, the courtyard in between. That building, that structure that is in the very middle of everything would be where you would have the holy place and the most holy place or the holy of holies as some of your translations read. And if you're looking and you're able to actually see some of the wording, if you look at the top part of that picture and you move just a little bit to your right, you'll see the words Solomon's porch and it will be directed at that outer left area of the temple courtyard where that wall is. Now, that particular wall is filled with a lot of columns and there is a walkway in there. So if you were out in the temple area, you would probably have the weather affect you, especially if it were snowing or raining. It would affect you much more so than if you were under the safety of this walkway with these many columns. If we were to perhaps consider a pictorial image of Jesus during that time, it might look something like this, where he has been walking through there and the Jews have approached him. And the Jews are going to ask him a very important question. But interestingly enough, it's not a question uh, that they've not asked before. In fact, I would ask you, have you ever been in those situations where people ask you a question, you give them an answer, and then they ask you the same question? Or maybe they ask you the same question over and over again. And you're kind of wondering, what's going on here? here? Am, am I failing to communicate? Is, is, is the problem me? Are they not listening to what I'm saying? Which, you know, in our household, I usually try to opt for that one. But my point is, what's going on? Is there a breakdown in communication? Is the sender not sending well? Is the receiver not receiving well? Or is it maybe a third option? Is it that the sender sending just fine in the case of Jesus but those who are receiving the message don't want to hear it. So it's with that in mind and the question that we're going to take a look at more closely that the Jews are going to ask Jesus, it's with that in mind that we're going to ask this question this morning from John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. Do you really want to know the answer? When you ask a question, do you really want to know the answer? You've probably heard that statement, that old saying said, don't ask a question if you don't want to hear the answer, if you don't want to know the answer. Well, it's interesting. They keep asking questions, but we are now starting to question over and over and over again as we go through chapter after chapter after chapter in the book of John. We're really starting to question, do they really want to know that answer? So I want you to take a look at that question, the question that they will ask in John 10 and verse 24. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, I do have to remind you, and I do have to be very clear about Jesus and how he answered questions. He did not always answer them plainly. He did always answer them correctly. And he did often answer them plainly. It was just not the answer the people were looking for. But I remind you of a sermon I've preached before in this congregation about how Jesus answered questions. It's something that we're taking a look at in our Fishers of Men class right now because if Jesus was, in fact, the master teacher, then we need to learn some lessons from his way of doing things. Jesus sometimes answered questions with questions. Sometimes he asked, answered questions with conditions. I'll do this if you do that. Sometimes he answered questions with parables. In other words, perhaps that plain answer wouldn't have worked, and so he laid a parable alongside a truth to help them to perhaps process it better and understand it more fully. Then we have those situations, one of my favorites, when Jesus answered questions with silence. One of my favorites. He knew they were trying to trap him, and so in some situations, he just didn't answer them. He just ignored them. But Jesus did, at times, answer the truth very, very plainly. And that is the question that is being asked of him now. Regardless of what he has done before and how he has answered them before, they want to know, are you the Christ? Simply, maybe as we would say today, yes or no? Which one is it? Yes or no? I want you to consider for just a moment the remainder of our lesson. First and foremost, to this question, Jesus is going to basically give two 
answers. And we're going to divide both of these answers up into individual parts. But I'm going to suggest to you this. Most of our text is going to come out of our passage in John 10 this morning. On the few occasions we're going to stray from this, just keep that passage marked because we'll come back to it. But this first answer that Jesus gives to a certain extent is not really anything new. He's simply saying what he's already said again. Perhaps to reinforce it, perhaps to show them that they haven't been listening. Maybe to reveal that they don't want to listen to the things that he's already said. But when they ask him, are you the Christ, tell us plainly, in John chapter 10, verses 25 and 26, we learn the following from Jesus' response. The first thing that he says is, I did. Are you the Christ? Answer us plainly, I did. In fact, he would go on in those two verses of Scripture to say, not only have I told you, but I've shown you. The words that I've spoken, the lessons that I've taught, maybe even the parables that I've tried to help you to use and to understand. That's one thing. What about the miracles? What about healing paralyzed men? What about healing blind men? Do you not see those good works as the works of God? Do you not, would you not recognize me as one sent from him? Does this not indicate and is it not consistent with the prophecies of old that reveal me to be the Christ, the anointed one, your king? He, he simply says, the problem's not me. It's you. The problem's not me, it's, it's you. When I was studying this particular passage of Scripture, it reminded me of all of those CEOs of tobacco companies back many years ago that stood before Congress. Remember that? They were asking, being asked questions, questions they probably didn't want to answer. But nobody really believed them because all of the CEOs of these tobacco companies felt like smoking cigarettes was like drinking orange juice or exercising or watching. They just thought it was a good thing. And it reminded me of a skit on a television show years ago where somebody was making fun of them and he was sitting there and he was very nervous and he was shaking and the whole time he's being answered asked questions he's he's fidgeting and he's sweating and and at one point in time he literally looks at the camera and he says it's not me is it it's it's him right it's him it's the other guy well this is kind of in some ways reminiscent of the attitudes of them asking over and over again until hopefully they get the right answer. But Jesus kind of beats them to the punch. He says, the problem's not with me. The problem is with you. You're not listening. You're not paying attention. You don't want to pay attention. So then that takes us to part two of that first answer. And we find this in verses 27 and 28 of the text. And this is where Jesus says, first and foremost, I know my sheep. Now, this is a reference to last week's lesson about the good shepherd and his sheep. And as Jesus is that good shepherd, he says, I know my sheep. Now, he's not talking about I know their names and that's it. What he's talking about is he has a relationship with them. He knows them. He knows them well. He knows them completely. He knows what they need. Uh, he knows how to provide for them, to care for them, to defend them. He knows his sheep. And as a result of his part in that relationship, he says, my sheep hear me, my sheep know me, and my sheep follow me. In other words, they have a relationship with me. They recognize me to be the shepherd, and as such, they act accordingly. They listen because they want to listen. They know because they want to learn. And they follow me because they want to do what I will for them. They want to walk in my footsteps. It's because of this that my sheep are going to be rewarded. They're going to gain something that the people to whom he is talking are not going to gain. They're going to gain something in this life. They're going to receive pasture and comfort and peace. And that's nothing compared to the life that they're going to receive in eternity. But once again, the problem's not with me. Jesus says the problem is with you. Now the third part of that first answer we find in verses 29 and 30. And this is where Jesus starts talking about the Father. And he starts bringing the relationship of the sheep and the Father and the Good Shepherd together. 
He says, my father gave my sheep to me. Now that's not to suggest anything like the, the false teaching of predestination or Calvinism or something like this. What it means here is that the Father gave him those who would follow, and those who follow are the ones who listen and abide in his will. I think about Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If that's the case, who is the author of our faith but God in heaven above? And so in some ways, those who are willing to listen to the words of Jesus and follow his teachings indeed are gifts from God to him. He then goes on to say, my father is greater than all. Now, the Jews would argue the same thing. They would say that God in heaven above, the heavenly father, is greater than all. They would agree with that. And yet they disagree with that very point because they don't realize who it is standing in front of them. That's God in the flesh. And so as a result of this, he would go on to make the point, he would say, no one will steal our sheep. Now, if you look at a little bit of the last passage of Scripture we looked at, and then you look at the first passage in this new section of Scripture, you'll find out that that's exactly what Jesus is saying. No one's going to snatch or steal these sheep out of my Father's hands. Nobody's going to snatch or steal these sheep out of my hand. Why? Well, real simple. My Father and I are one. My father and I are one. Now remember to pay attention to whom he is saying this. He is saying this to a group of people who probably from the get-go don't really care for him too much and certainly are not paying attention to his answers so that they might learn from them. So it probably doesn't surprise us very much in verse 31 when the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And I do want you to point, I want you to point out something. Notice verse 31. It says the Jews picked up stones again to stone him because this isn't the first time that's happened. If you remember back in chapter 8 and verse 59, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus himself, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why did they stone him? Well, they didn't like the idea of who he was and what he was teaching. And so that was their way of fixing the problem. Let's just kill the messenger. Let's just kill this guy, and let's go back to life the way we want it. Now, here's what's interesting. In the very next verse of Scripture, verse 32, Jesus answered them. And I want you to notice that. What is Jesus answering? They didn't just ask a question. They're throwing stones at them. And I almost wonder, is Jesus answering their attitude and their reaction to his teaching through this stoning? Or do we go back to the original question, are you the Christ just say it plainly. Yes or no? Are you the Christ? So this is really where we get into this next answer, this next response from Jesus. Because Jesus answered them, I show you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? Which good work are you punishing me for? Healing the paralyzed man, healing the blind man, maybe uh, even teaching you the words of life that will help you uh, overcome sin and live eternally in heaven. Which exactly, which one of these works are you punishing me for? Now their answer is very interesting. Uh, to a certain extent, it is one of denial. The Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you. That right there is a lie. Because first and foremost, we know Jesus never did anything but good works. Secondly, even the, the, the people from amongst their own number were questioning the validity of what was going on. And I'm not talking about in a negative way. I'm talking about in a positive way. In episode after episode after episode where people don't want to listen to Jesus, they rebuke him, they, uh, they try to kill him, they try to force him out of their midst, whatever. There's always somebody who shows up going, you know, I think what he's saying is right. I think this may be the Christ. This may, in fact, be the Messiah we've been waiting for. Somebody always draws that conclusion. But Jesus didn't do anything wrong. They said, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. That's why we're stoning you. Now, the word blaspheme means not to speak against, but to speak evil against. And the context of that means to speak evil against something that is pure or innocent, undefiled, good. So for instance, God who is described in scripture as light and in him there is no darkness at all, it would be improper, it would be wrong, it would be sinful, it would be blasphemous 
to accuse God of lying to accuse God of wanting to hurt people, to accuse God of any such evil, that would be, by definition, blasphemy. And that is what they are accusing Jesus of doing. And by the way, not necessarily the first time. I want you to consider what is mentioned in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 3. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 3. Some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. Why? Well, because he had the audacity to forgive someone of their sins. Now, the Jews understood that only God could forgive someone of their sins. So they had that much right. The problem was they did not realize that Jesus was, in fact, God. And when Jesus healed the paralyzed man and then went on to say, after that good deed, he went on to say, your sins are forgiven, now they just blew up. They couldn't handle that. At this point in time, this is just, this is terrible. Only deity, only the creator, only God in heaven above can forgive sins. And this guy just claimed to have that authority. He must be blaspheming. Once again, they're drawing wrong conclusions. They're not listening. They're not paying attention. They just want to go with what they think and accuse him of blasphemy. And then, of course, they say, and because you being a man make yourself out to be God. Well, consider what John chapter 5 and verse 18 reads. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. You remember that story? This is where he calls into question Father Abraham. And, and you remember that Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am, suggesting eternality suggesting equivalency with God, suggesting that he is God. And that's because he was. He is. John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and we know that the Word here is Jesus, and, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was God. He was just God in the flesh at this moment in time. And perhaps they couldn't see beyond the skin. Perhaps they couldn't see beyond the skeleton. They just couldn't fathom that God would be there in their presence. But for whatever reason, the very thing he claimed to be, which was accurate in its claim, is what they had the problem with. So Jesus answers again. And in this section of Scripture, this is where we start getting into some things that not, he has not really said before. He uses a different line of reasoning to make his point. So we take a look at John chapter 10 verses 34, 35 and 36. And to Jesus's and to their question again, are you the Christ? Answer us plainly. Jesus's second answer goes a little bit like this. First and foremost, consider your law. Now, that is an interesting uh, demonstration of phraseology because he literally says, has it not been written in your law such and such? Now before we get into the such and such, I want you to just understand what he's saying there. He could have said, have you not read written in the law? Because there was only one. That was that Old Testament covenant. Uh, maybe he would say the law in reference specifically to the law of Moses out of which this came. Uh, maybe he could have said the Lord's law. Maybe he said, have you not read or have you not, has it not been written in my law since he's the author of it? But it's interesting. He says, has it not been written in your law? Now, this is what's interesting because he's not only demonstrating some commonality in the fact that they both are, that they all are Jews and they're all following the law of Moses, but he's also trying to use their thinking, their beliefs, and their reasoning to help them to conclude an ultimate point. This would be like the following. If a creationist and an evolutionist had a discussion, how would the creationist convince the evolutionist who does not believe that there is a God, who does not believe in deity, certainly doesn't believe in the Bible, how would the creationist teach the evolutionist how to accept the truth that comes from God. Would he start off by quoting Genesis 1-1? Well, we know there's a God, and he wrote the Bible because Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is that going to convince somebody who doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in the Bible to cite the very words of the very person that they don't believe in? No. 
You know what you do? You cite their Bible. You go to their belief system. You, you talk about what it is they hold dear. For instance, evolutionists, those who are against God and therefore believe in, in atheistic evolution, that everything blew into existence out of nothing, and, and that everything evolved from a tiny little amoeba, you go to that person and you say, your law, your science that has scientific laws, it establishes that first and foremost, you can't have something that comes from nothing. The law of biogenesis refutes that. You go to them and say, and doesn't your law say that you, that you can't have one kind give rise to another kind? That you've never actually noticeably observed any type of animal giving birth to a completely different kind of animal? You've never seen a fish give birth to a puppy. You've never seen a cow give birth to a horse. They're completely different. And as a result, doesn't your law say that ultimately something had to start all of this and he also created it according to its kind? Well, that's how a creationist would talk to an evolutionist. This is how Jesus is talking to the people. He's not going to say, hey, trust me. He's going to say, go to your own book. Go to your own writings. Go to God's word that you accept and that you believe and consider the following. Now, I want you to notice, and if you're in John 10, where I hope you are, please do me a favor, stick your finger in there, stick a bookmark in there. Everybody within the sound of my voice turn to the book of Psalms because this is a verse we don't turn to very often. This is a verse of Scripture that's not referenced very often. And I want you to look at it because it's really interesting. It has caused a great deal of confusion, but I think Jesus explains it rather nicely. In Psalm chapter 82 and verse 6, Psalm 82 and verse 6, Jesus has just gotten through saying, has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Who in the world would be saying that? Obviously a false teacher. Obviously somebody who doesn't know what he's talking about would be saying that. Well, according to the text... Maybe this is God. Maybe this is God directly saying it. Maybe this is the psalmist who is writing it down by the inspiration of God. Either way, the source comes from God. And Psalm 82 and verse 6 reads, I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Now, I have to say right now, some of the people that have misunderstood this and have created a false teaching out of this come out of the Mormon faith. They, for instance, believe, based on scriptures like this, that the God of our world was a human being on another planet. And because he was a faithful Mormon on that planet, he got elevated and promoted, basically, to be the God of our world. And guess what? If you are a righteous Mormon in this life, you get to be promoted in the next life to be the God of your own planet. That is not what is being taught here. It's not even remotely what is being taught here. If I could describe what is being said here, I would probably go to the book of Ephesians to do it. And I'm just going to reference this. But in the book of Ephesians, in the first chapter, Paul talks about the many spiritual blessings we have in Christ. And one of the spiritual blessings that we have as Christians in Christ is that we get to be children of God, sons of God daughters of God, but we get to be a part of the family of God. Now, if God is our Father, does that make us gods? Well, not literally, but figuratively, that's what it's talking about. A lot of times, for instance, people will call, since Jesus in the flesh was the Son of God and we're sons of God, have you ever heard somebody call Jesus their older brother? Well, he's not really your older brother. I've got one older brother, Larry, you know, he lives up in Tennessee and Okay, but spiritually speaking, I understand what they're saying. He's my older spiritual brother. I get it. It's a metaphor. It's an analogy. It's a figure of speech. And so is this right here. Let me give you an example of what we're talking about. If you look at Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh. Now you remember when Moses was sent to Pharaoh, uh, he didn't like that. We'll get into that in just a minute. But... When Moses went to God, 
Moses, or when Moses went to Pharaoh on behalf of God, he was a mouthpiece for God. He spoke for God. He had the authority of God. So in every shape, form, and fashion, he was over Pharaoh. Without God, it's just two human beings in a room talking. One with earthly power and one who didn't have a lot of earthly power. But with God present and with him backing Moses, he basically says, you speak what I tell you, and it will be as if, as if you are a God over Pharaoh. Not a literal God, but you will be my representative over him. Now, it's very similar if you get, went back a few chapters to when God actually called Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. You remember Moses didn't like that idea. And he came up with a whole host of excuses, one of which was, you know, I don't speak very well. I, I can't communicate very well. I, I, I trip over my tongue when I talk. And so you need somebody else who's a better orator than I am. It's very interesting. In Exodus 4 and verse 16, moreover, he shall speak for you to the people. God's solution to Moses' objection is, don't you have a brother by the name of Aaron? He can speak pretty well, can he? How about I give you the information, you tell Aaron what to say, and he'll be able to present it just fine. Listen to what it says. He will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as a God to him. That doesn't mean that Aaron turns around and falls down and starts worshiping Moses. He's not using the word in that way. What he is saying, though, is you will have the authority over him and you'll tell him what to say just like I'm telling you what to say. Now, you will be as a God to him. Now, take that into consideration and look at this passage of Scripture. Let's go back to John chapter 10 for just a second and let's look at what Jesus says. Has it not been written in your law, I said, you are God's? Now listen to what happens next. Because not only does he say consider your law, now he says consider your logic. Jesus says in verse 35, if he called them gods, talking about the author or the insp inspiration of uh, Psalm chapter 82, if in fact he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, Jesus is saying, we've got that in common. We believe the word of God, and it's, it's final. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? How can you say that? If, G, if, if God inspired men to write these things down, that there will be some who will be like God, how can you say, at the very least, if I fit that description, how can you say I'm blaspheming? That doesn't make sense. If in fact I am sent from God, if I am a mouthpiece for God, if I am here to do the Father's will, how can you call that wrong? Just because I say I am the Son of God? What he ultimately says is, consider your error, I am the Son of God. I am the Son of God. Not only have I taught truth and done truth, but I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Consider the fact that in all of this, you might just be wrong. Have you ever come across somebody who was just so willing to argue their point, no matter how wrong they were, they just were not willing to acknowledge that they'd made a mistake? Please, don't point your fingers at me. You ever known somebody like that? I have. And it didn't matter what I said. They were going to stick with their point. In fact, I've seen those moments in time where we're in a discussion. That might be a nice way of saying an argument. But we're in a discussion and we're both presenting our sides. I've even seen that light bulb moment go off in their head where they realized that what they were saying was wrong. And they still wouldn't acknowledge it. Well, error is still error whether you acknowledge it or not. And that brings us to the second part of Jesus' second answer. And we find this in John 10 verses 37 and 38. And it is in this passage of Scripture that Jesus starts to enjoin once again his relationship with the Father. But he does it a little bit differently. And there's not a real good way that I could take these two and write them down in some kind of parallel fashion. First and foremost, Jesus simply says this, Do not believe my words if my actions don't back them up. So, if my actions are wrong, 
if my actions are inconsistent with God, if in fact what I've done is evil, don't listen to what I'm saying. That would be inconsistent. That would be consistent with the hypocrites who say, do as I say, not as I do. And you even remember Jesus talking about the Pharisees and telling the people, listen to what they say because a lot of what they say is right, but just don't follow their example because they're way off in that department. Do not believe my words if, I, if my actions don't back them up. But listen to what he says next. You may not believe me, but open your eyes. Believe what you see. The devil doesn't help the lame. The devil doesn't help the blind. The devil doesn't help the lost. He wants to lead you into the state of being lost, not lead you out of it. He doesn't want to lead you into peace and joy. He wants to lead you into storms and torment. You may not believe me, but believe what you see. If my actions are from God, then I am from God. Know the Father through me. In other words, be open-minded. Be objective. Be fair. Maybe a better word to use would be just. But actually weigh what I'm saying against the scriptures and see if they're consistent or inconsistent. Weigh what I'm doing with the scriptures and see if they're consistent or inconsistent. And if, in fact, you, you don't believe me, you've come to me with that bias, but you can honestly say that my works are good, then that demonstrates your inconsistency and should lead you to the very simple truth that I am from God. And if, in fact, that's the case, know God, know my Heavenly Father through me. It's kind of like what Jesus would say on one occasion. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because we are one. It's interesting. There are still going to be those people who are stubborn. Still going to be those people who do not want to hear the truth. And we're still in that situation with the story of Jesus. In John 10 and in verse 39 in particular we read, Therefore they were seeking again to seize him and he eluded their grasp. They're, they still don't like them. They're still not listening to them. They're certainly not going to follow them. And as a result of that, we read that he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there, and many came to him and were saying, and here we go. No matter how many people don't like Jesus, somebody always ends up liking him. No matter how many people don't believe in him, somebody ends up believing him. Because whatever he says, whether he's quoting the Old Testament, whether he's demonstrating the wisdom of his knowledge, whether he's showing the goodness in his actions, somebody always walks away going, you know, I kind of think this guy might be the real deal. You know, all y'all are saying he's not the Messiah. Maybe he is the Messiah. And it's interesting. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, and this is important to understand, John the baptizer, who's being referenced here, a great teacher, a fantastic preacher. Jesus described him the best on the face of the planet. This guy who ate funny things and dressed in funny ways, who hung out in the wilderness, had all of Jer Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding area coming out into the wilderness, not only to hear his amazing preaching, but to be baptized by him in the Jordan. Even the Pharisees came out to hear what all the discussion was about. But not once do the scriptures ever say that, Jesus, that John had any miraculous ability other than the revealed knowledge of God's will for him to share with the people. We don't have any record that John ever helped a lame man to walk. We don't have any record that John ever helped a blind man to see. We don't have any record that John ever looked at someone and tried to spiritually heal them from their sin by saying, your sins are forgiven. All he did was preach about the coming Messiah of whom he was a forerunner. And in fact, when Jesus shows up on the scene, John says, I've been in the forefront, but now I'm going to take a step back. Because the one that I've been paving the way for, he's here. He's come. Behold 
the Lamb of God. You know what a lot of these people who heard John, who have now heard Jesus, who have now witnessed what he's said and done, while John performed no sign or no miracle, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. In other words, there are some people who are opening, open to listening to the truth. There are some people who are open to logic and to reason. And there are some people who are just willing to step out on faith and go, you know something? I've seen no hypocrisy here. I've witnessed no inconsistency. What I have witnessed over and over and over and over again is consistent demonstrations of who I know God to be. And many of them said, indeed, this must be the Messiah. This must be the answer to the question, the Son of God. I want you to consider that question for just a minute. Are you really looking for the answer? Because this is not just for a bunch of first century people who were critics and doubters of Jesus. This might be for us as well. Now, we come together here as a body of believers and we say that, but the question is, is that really why we come? I want you to think in your heart of hearts, are you really here because your wife drug you? Are you really here because your parents drug you? Are, are you really here because you're kind of expected to be here and so in some way, shape, form, or fashion, even though it's not very good, you kind of guilted your way into the building? Is that how we approach Scripture? Because I want you to consider that for just a minute. When we open the Bible, do we do the same thing? Are we reading the Bible because the preacher's reading from the Bible and he just told me to turn to Psalms? Or are we reading the Bible because, you know, the person next to us has opened their Bible so we kind of feel obligated to do it? How are we about approaching truth? Are we doing the same thing with him in that way? Do we search the Word of God for answers that we want him to answer? Or do we search the Word of God for his answer? And when we find his answer, oh, by the way, his answer says don't murder. We're all in agreement with that. His answer says don't commit adultery. We're all in agreement with that. But his answer also submit, says submit yourselves one to another. Well, I don't mind submitting myself to this guy over here because he's a pretty nice guy and he's a little older than I am. But now I, I'm not submitting myself to this person over here. She's a woman. Can't be doing that. Are we looking for the answer? Are we really looking for the answers? Or are we just looking for what we want to hear? You see, my recommendation this morning is that we look and we really look for the answers that has been revealed to us in God's Word. That we look for His answers. That we look for the revelations He's given us. And although perhaps some of us who have been Christians for a number of years agree with most of what the Bible says. What about that one verse of Scripture that comes along that we just kind of have a hard time accepting? We kind of have a hard time acknowledging. Why? Because it requires change in our lives, the very thing that Jesus was requiring of these people. You realize these people that were coming to Jesus, he's saying, you're not going to be saved because you're not my sheep. And the reason you're not my sheep is because you're not really looking for the answers. You're just looking to please yourselves. Brethren, we can't have that attitude. If there's any here this morning who is outside of Christ, you can't have that attitude because there is no salvation in self. There is only salvation in Christ Jesus. So if you have not put on your Lord and Savior in baptism, do it this morning. If you don't know exactly what that means or you want to make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, let us sit down and study with you to make sure you understand what God wants you to do, that you understand his answers so that you can fully accept it and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you are a child of God, as is probably the case with most of the people assembled here this morning and maybe even most who are joining us online, here's my question. Are you accepting of all of God's word? Are you really looking for all of the answers that he's providing? We live in difficult times. We live in divisive times. We live in times where people are picking sides, and they're not just picking sides in politics. Sometimes they pick sides even within the body of Christ. There's one side you need to pick, and that's the Lord's side. There is one set of answers that you need to seek, and that's God's. And when he has spoken, if you're truly fighting on the side of right, 
you'll not only accept it, you'll be glad to obey it. Because in the end, it's pleasing to him and it's salvation for us. So this morning, ask yourself the question, are you really looking for the answers? While together we stand and sing.